Okay, so we know why we're sampling and we've got some definitions to work with. Let's talk about simple random sampling with replacement. We're going to do two things in this video. We're going to talk about how we get the estimated count and how we estimate the precision of our estimate. So there's really only one question we need to address when we're designing a simple random sample with replacement. And that is, how many sample units do we want to select? So if you recall, this whole grid here is our sample frame, and we are choosing uh, some number of the units within that sample frame. So these are the squares. And then within each of the squares that we sample, we're going to count the elements that we're monitoring or sampling, and those are the blue diamonds. We're going to call that number of units little n, and for the moment, we're going to um, postpone the question of how many is enough um, until we get a little bit farther along. The first question is, how do we estimate the count of our units, or of our elements within the sample units. So the estimated count, or the estimated mean number of elements per sample unit is just going to be the sample mean. So we take our sample, and within each sample we have y sub i, where i is just, just a count of which sample unit we're looking at. We're going to add those up, and we divide by little n, the number of sample units. And we call this a y bar, and we give it a little hat to indicate that it's an estimate. To distinguish it from y bar without a hat, which is the true mean across the sample population. Okay, so we know we don't know what that value is, but we know there is one. So we have we can talk about y bar, the true mean. And then we have y bar hat, which is our estimate, or a sample mean, is sometimes called as well. So getting the estimated count is actually pretty easy. What's harder is to try and understand the precision of our estimate, because variation in the number of elements per unit comes from a number of different sources. And uh, this is a quote from Yogi Berra, indicating that, you know, the past was not predictable when it started. And this is true of eco in ecology as well. So we have a lot of temporal and spatial variation. So if we, we go from one place to another, we get a large variation in the count from one place to that to uh, the next. And if we keep sampling the same area over time, we're going to get variation in time. Populations increase and they decrease. And so both of those things are actually interesting to us. We, we are interested in understanding what causes both temporal and spatial variation in ecology. Unfortunately, though, that's not the only source. These are natural sources of variability, okay? But it's not the only source of variation that's going to cause uh, our estimate to be not exactly the same as the true value of the mean. In particular, we're going to have a sample at each point and in, in each area. And there, among those units within that sample, there's going to be variation. So within each of the green squares, you can think of those as our sample units. Some of them have more of the individuals, of the elements that we're counting, and some of them have less. So that's that among sample unit variation. And then further, when we go to count within those areas, we might have enumeration variation. In other words, we might not count uh, exactly the number of individuals that are in there. So this could happen in a number of different ways. Um, you could miss individuals, so you fail to detect uh, a tiger that's in a particular block, or you might count the same tiger twice, thinking it's two different individuals. Both of those are going to cause enumeration variation within a sample unit. So if you were to, essentially that variation comes from, if you were to go back to that same sample unit and count it again, 
you'd get a different number. And that's almost always true uh, for anything that isn't like a tree. Okay, that uh, trees are pretty easy to make sure you count the same number every time unless you're dealing with seedlings. Um, but uh, with pretty much every kind of mobile animal, uh, mobile uh, species, this is going to be hard to get it exact every single time. Together, we call these two sources of variation, the variation among units within our sample frame and the variation in our count from within each unit, call that sampling variation. And what we want to be able to do is to sort of quantify that sampling variation so that when we're looking at variation over time and across space, we can sort of subtract off that sampling variation and understand how much of the variation we're seeing is natural variation versus sampling variation. So how do we go about doing that? Well, the way we're going to do it is we're going to look at the variance of our counts. And there's going to be some true variance, the population variance, which is going to be um, estimated using this particular quantity here. So we're going to look at uh, our, the, the, here's, if this orange bar is the count in one unit and this green bar is the true mean, we look at the difference between that, we square it and add those up. So what this gives us is the average squared difference or population variance. So you've probably heard about var uh, the quantity variance, but you might not have realized that it's the average squared difference between any observation and the mean value. In the case of the population variance, it's the true mean. And so, um, th again, this is one of these sort of theoretical quantities We'd like to know what this quantity is, but we usually don't. Okay, what we can get is an estimate of the variance, and we call that the sample variance. And we calculate it in much the same way, except that instead of our true value here, we have our uh, sample mean, okay, estimated mean. So if we look at our each of our observations. We get the difference between that observation and the sample mean, and we square those, we add them up, and we divide by the sample size minus one. And the reason why we divide by minus one is because what we have here is an estimate of y. So we've already used up, if you like, one data point to calculate the mean. And um, so we have fewer data points to estimate our variance. All right, and so this is why it takes at least three observations to calculate a variance, because if we, um, if we have uh, two observations, then uh, this down here devolves down to a single number, uh, n2 minus 1 is just 1, and our sum up here is going to be, um, well, actually, I think you could calculate with two, um, but you can't calculate it with one. And, it, and that, that seems kind of clear, right? If you have a single observation, you can't tell how variable they are. It's going to be an, uh, an undefined number. You have two, you're going to be able to get that uh, average difference, but it's going to be um, a pretty wobbly number compared to our true value. So that gives us the variance or the sample variance of the counts, but that's mostly not what we're interested in. We are often usually interested in how precise is our estimate of the average count. And to get that, we have to do a further step, which is to calculate the standard error of our mean, of the sample mean. And to do that, what we're going to do is we take our sample variance and we divide it again by n, the sample size, and we take the square root of that because it's the standard error. Um, so this metric, standard error, is going to be on the same scale as the mean, because we've taken the square root, and it will be an, a, an estimate of how precise our mean actually is. And this is where we get to the question of how many observations is enough. If you notice down here, the sample size n is in the denominator. So the more observations we collect, the more precise our estimate will be. As we get more, it will 
come down, the standard error will come down. Even if the variance of the counts does not go down, and it, it doesn't as you increase your sample size, the variance of the counts is going to stay the same. It will be whatever that true variation amongst units is. But our estimate of the mean does get more precise as we get um, to larger and larger sample sizes. A, because this is actually yeah, the square root of n, um, it's not linear, so it declines quickly when we have a small sample size, and then once you get up to larger and larger sample sizes, it gets sort of diminishing returns. Finally, there's a few other quantities that you're going to be interested in um, from your intro statistics. Um, we might want to calculate from our mean, we might want to calculate the confidence limits on our observations. And we would do that by taking our sample mean and we either add or subtract the standard error of that sample mean multiplied by a t-statistic. It's beyond the scope of this course to talk about why we use that particular t-statistic, but um, we do. And for a reasonably large sample sizes, n bigger than 30, this is about 1.96, or about 2. So as a good rule of thumb, plus or minus 2 times the standard error is approximately a 95% confidence interval. The other quantity that's sometimes useful is the coefficient of variation, and that's the standard error divided by the sample mean. So it represents how variable is your population as a percentage of the mean. So let's take a quick look at an example. Go back to our uh, sample population here, and we're going to draw a sample of 10 units, right? So each of these squares is a unit, so we're going to draw 10 units out of here. And we're drawing them with replacement, which what that means is that when we select one, we go back and we select it. We, there's a possibility that it could be drawn a second time. Um, so we don't, if this was being done in reality, we wouldn't have to count that quadrat twice, we've already done it. We would just include the observation twice. Now this might seem a little counterintuitive to ecologists, they get a little uncomfortable with that idea, but this is basically what you are um, meant to do when you're sampling with replacement, which gives you the simplest um, uh, equations. We'll talk in another video, I'll show you how you correct for the fact that if you want to sample without replacement, you have to make something a little bit different. So we're going to sample without replacement. And then we're going to calculate the mean, and we're going to repeat that process a thousand times. And this is going to show us what is the distribution of the mean counts, um, or actually the estimated uh, number, because I'll multi I've ended up multiplying it by 100 to get the total estimate of the total number of points within the quadrat, within our sample frame which is the whole square. So if we do that a thousand times, this is the sort of thing that we get. There's that green bar there, that's our true value, it was about 98 uh, dots in that sample of 100 units. We take 10 each time and calculate the mean. And we get this sort of histogram here. It looks a little bit normal, maybe a bit skewed to the right, you can't have values that are less than zero here. If we were to take larger sample sizes, say 20, um, we would see that this histogram would shrink down around the true value. It would have a narrower range and it would become more normal looking. It's going to converge to a normal distribution as our sample size gets larger and larger. Coefficient of variation is about 28%. So taking a sample of 10 out of 100 units is um, not going to give you a very precise estimate of the mean. If we take a brief look at the confidence limits, might not have had a look at this. This is just 10 or, or 20 of those samples. can't remember some number of those samples. Here's the sample mean, and then here are the confidence limits. And what you notice is that sometimes the confidence limits are narrow, sometimes they're really wide, um, and occasionally they don't overlap the true value at all, or only barely. Um, and so this is what we mean by a 95% confidence limit. If we repeat the procedure a hundred times or a thousand times, 
we would expect 95% of those limits to include the true value, that green line. Um, so about 5% then are not going to include the true line. We don't know whether, when we actually calculate any given sample, we don't know whether it's in or out. Okay, So it's important to keep that in mind when you're looking at those confidence limits. Um, especially with small sample sizes, they're going to wobble all over the place. The other thing to notice here with these sample sizes is that um, some of the, or with these confidence limits, is that a lot of the ones that are wider actually have lower confidence limits that are less than zero. Um, and this is a consequence of our ignoring the fact that we can't have values less than zero. Um, in a more sophisticated sort of sampling procedure or, or analysis procedure, we could account for that. Um, but again, that's beyond the scope of this course where we're mostly just interested in making figures.